Hi, I'm Mivy James. I'm Digital Transformation Director at BAE Systems and I've been an IT professional for nearly 30 years now and I'm here to represent. Please can you explain in two or three sentences what you do day to day? So that's a great question because um, it's actually, I wrote my own job description, um, persuaded uh, my company to promote me into it uh, just over a year ago. So I'm still figuring it out slightly. Um, but on a day to day basis, I advise our customers on their digital transformation journey. Um, and what I mean by that is really helping them modernize their businesses to be more data centric, to make more use of agile ways of doing software delivery. Um, and to have a, a sort of a digital culture. And my customers are government departments, mainly the UK defence sector. That's what BA Systems is known for, but other government departments as well. Um, so it's a very customer facing role. But I also work then internally into our business um, to help us transform because uh, because we need to be what I would call self-evident on that digital journey ourselves. Please, can you tell us about your early career and how it got you to where you are today? So I entered the tech industry actually whilst I was still at university and I did computer science and maths at university um, and uh, having done all, all science A level so I did maths further maths physics and chemistry no computer science because my school didn't offer it at the time um, and uh, and when I was a student I had some summer jobs working as a coder uh, which is uh, quite a well-paid student job uh, compared to working in a cafe perhaps um, and, uh, and so by the time I graduated I had some practical experience um, and I started my career then as, as an what we call an anal analyst programmer so I was doing a lot of coding um, but I also had to kind of understand the customer requirements some of the stuff I did early on unsurprisingly given my degree was very sort of maths uh, sort of related algorithms what we might call now building digital twins um, and uh, and I then um, quite quickly moved on to sort of leading teams of developers doing system design um, and uh, kind of listening to the customers to help them with their requirements and turn them in, into design and then the build um, and then throughout throughout my career I've done more of the design and architecture, less of the coding um, year on year until it got to the point that I realized I hadn't written any code for a long time. Um, and uh, the sort of the, the level of strategy that I do now is, is quite abstract um, and sort of at the top levels of, of really big government departments and, and quite a long way from the code, which I must miss, I, I admit I miss writing code sometimes. Um, but uh, that's, so, but I think that's a sort of, um, I never planned to be where I am now, um, but that kind of going in as a computer science graduate is quite a traditional way to, to start being a, a coder. What barriers have you faced and overcome as a woman in tech? I mean, I went to Manchester University, which is a really big university for computer science, um, but there were still hardly any girls. Um, and having done my A-levels in an all-girls school, it was a bit of a shock. I wasn't expecting uh, it to be 50-50, uh, but I remember standing outside uh, kind of, you know, sort of my first weeks at university and going, everyone's looking at me and then looking around going, right, uh, at that particular group of people who'd moved from lecture A to lecture B, I was the only girl in that, in that group of about like 30 or 40. Um, and that was a bit of a shock um, and disappointing, really. I, I'd, I had hoped that it would be different to that. Um, and uh, and then when I started my career, um, I was often the um, the only or one of a few um, female coders. Um, and that's not really budged um, throughout my career path. In fact, I'd say as I've become more senior and when I became an architect and an enterprise architect, it was even less likely that I worked with a, with a technical woman. I I'd work with in teams with other women. They'd often be in a project management role or a business analyst role. So it wasn't I wasn't completely isolated. But when we just looked at the sort of engineering or technical leadership, um, I'd often be the only um, uh, woman there. What's the personal strength of yours? that has led to your success as a tech leader? So I think it's, it's quite easy to, to think about the, um, to fall into the trap in a way of thinking that to be a leader in technology, you have to have um, really in-depth technical knowledge and almost nothing else. That's only going to get you so far. Um, what's key is being able to share your thoughts with other people and influence them. I spend a lot of my time persuading non-technical people that there is a technical solution to what they want to achieve. Um, and uh, without bamboozling them with the technical 
technical aspects. So communication skills, powers of persuasion and influence are absolutely key. Um, and and kind of one of the things that I um, sort of really like doing is sort of joining joining the dots and recognising that there's uh, a connection to sort of something over here to some to something over there um, at a sort of almost a, sort of quite an quite an abstract level. So being able to see that big picture. Um, because it's quite easy to fall into the trap of sort of going down into into the weeds of something and be having being able to lift your head out uh, of of those weeds um, and look look more broadly is um, is key. And and some of the lessons I've learned the hard way in technology is that some of the most enduring things that I've designed or built have almost been my worst hours of an engine as an engineer. Kind of a, a sort of things where uh, we'll, we'll we'll lash those things together, equivalent of lashing things together with tape. Uh, and going, we'll, we'll fix that later. Um, and that's the stuff which re- has really lasted because it's actually done the job. So thinking about um, understanding how much uh, it's worth spending on fixing a problem um, is key to leadership um, because you can be technically purist about it. And it's really interesting and a very nice kind of intellectual exercise, um, but it's not necessarily going to get traction with the business. So kind of having that sort of pra- pragmatic approach to things even though you kind of think, well, I'd love to actually do this properly and be a pure computer scientist or architect about it. That's not necessarily the right answer. Um, so knowing when that is or isn't the right answer is uh, is essential to being a technology leader. What advice would you give women wanting to make a career switch to tech with no previous tech experience? Lots of, lots of organisations now are recruiting through more unconventional routes so they're not just going out to universities and, and taking people in through that route. We're, we're definitely not going to get enough people that way. And I think if, if the opportunity arises for networking sessions to go and meet people who, who work in different types of organisations, um, it's very worthwhile along, going along to those kind of things because you might end up meeting somebody who uh, has the perfect opportunity for you um, or uh, would just uh, quite happily share some insights and kind of bring it to life a little bit more. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier was I did um, I did summer jobs and I did some work experience, which which confirmed to me that that was the right career path for me. Um, and they're quite short term things. So I, I wonder if there's an equivalent for career switches. So you're not committing to a long term job role, but trying out some internships or trying out something in the short term to kind of partly boost your confidence um, but also just to really test the waters that that's, uh, that's the type of environment that, uh, that you want to work in, even if that individual company that you're doing that type of thing for um, is not your, going to be your long-term home. Um, so I think that's sort of, sort of taking, rather than going, this, is, this has got to be it, this is my kind of career pivot moment, um, this is something where I'm testing the waters a little bit, um, might be a good way to sort of uh, to build up some confidence because it def- definitely helped me by the time I started that proper job um, I'd already had uh, some real world coding experience and practical and some practical experience. What advice would you give women trying to balance family commitments and a career in tech? One of the things that I really emphasise with uh, companies that I work with is we really need to move on from this idea of uh, of seeing that parenthood is something that only women do. Um, you know, what's enabled me in my career is, you know, I'm fortunate enough to not be a single parent and we juggle the childcare responsibilities between us. Um, and what it looks like now is different to, as you can probably see a little kid in a reindeer outfit, he's a bit older than that now, um, behind me that he's, uh, that we, we juggle the school runs between us. Um, and so we sort of, you know, tag team on, on, on parenting. Um, and think that the, if the sort of, if, if companies continue to have this mindset that, um, all women are mothers and only mothers are responsible for childcare, then uh, then we, we sort of continue to sort of see almost employing women as a bit of a problem area, which it absolutely shouldn't be. Plenty of men want to be more hands-on parents and we need to kind of help help, help enable that. And so that's sort of, that sort of, I suppose we need, it's very important for us as a society and for employers to kind of move on from, from thinking that uh, women are the sole caregivers, um, where they have those kind of responsibilities. So that's kind of a, a bit of a soapbox moment there for me. What advice? Would you give any woman wanting to find a mentor? Think, uh, one of the things that I think is really important if you're, I, I think we live in a world where everybody thinks they need to have a mentor and the mentor is going to ha- provide some magic for career development. I think what's, what's absolutely essential is knowing what you want from your mentor 
and you're not necessarily going to have the same mentor forever and you might have multiple mentors so be very specific about what you want to get out of that mentor and conversation what I find it's always flattering to be asked but I find that people come to me and say will you mentor me and then I say well what do you want some help with and they can't answer that question and it's quite frustrating because I want to help them but if they don't know specifically how I could help them um, then it just it just feels like a sort of a bit of a noodling type conversation and, and, and then I kind of walk away thinking well I've let that person down um, I don't know that I've helped them at all um, because so so kind of my first thing is, is think about think about what you what you want from a mentor um, and be very specific and recognize that you might have a mentor for one particular thing for a set amount of time and then and then it's okay to kind of go well I I need something else now or I'll go to somebody somebody different to get something else um, and uh, you know I've I've found that for example uh, you know I got to a point in my career technically where I sort of kind of knew what I knew and, and what I didn't know and I could go and fill in the gaps by having specific conversations with people or researching stuff um, what I wanted was some mentoring on some of the softer skills so uh, and particularly because I'm in a very customer facing role some of that stakeholder engagement so I specifically sought out mentorship from people in sales and account management type roles not technical roles at all because that's what I needed at that at that point in time or thought would be most useful um, so uh, I think also yeah also think about that um, and I think the one thing that's important to, to, to understand is the difference between mentoring and sponsorship. Um, I heard the phrase used that sort of women are over mentored and under sponsored. The thing that really makes a difference with your career development is sponsorship. And it's often something you don't know that it's when it's happening and your sponsor can come from anywhere. Like I know that uh, some of the sort of customer stakeholders I have are key sponsors of mine because then they speak to senior people in my own organization and uh, and then mention something that I've helped them with, for example. And that senior person may not have known who I was pr prior to that. So um, that uh, and and in sponsors can kind of create stretch opportunities for you. Um, as a, sometimes I um, I sort of have random taskings for, for for people. If they do a great job, I'll then put them forward for for something else. Um, and I've noticed that some of those individuals, it's really accelerated their their careers quite early on in their career paths. Um, and so uh, kind of understand the difference between what a mentor is going to give you and, and what a sponsor is going to give you. Because I think the, the, that sponsorship, I think, is the thing that can really accelerate your career um, in a way that maybe mentorship doesn't. Mentorship is advice, but they're not going to fix things for you or create opportunities for you. What has been the biggest professional challenge that you have faced and overcome? So when I... When I look back on my early career, I was very conscious that often um, I was the only technical woman that somebody might have ever worked with. Um, and I carried that with me as a burden. And what I mean by that is I felt that I couldn't afford to make any mistakes that had to be flawless. Um, and I put myself under a lot of pressure um, and not just on, just sort of on the, on, the, on the technical things, because I felt like there were, you know, there are naysayers. Um, and uh, the uh, and then they would kind of go, well, see, this is you know you, this is what happens if you like women can't do tech because we had that movie do something and she messed it up. So that was definitely um, I know you know nobody ever overtly said that to me, but it's it's kind of a, a sort of a chip that I carried on my shoulder for a long time. So I set myself impossibly high standards. Um, and uh, and probably worked um, too many hours um, and didn't ask for help as often as I could have done because I felt like I couldn't admit that I needed help um, and uh, and so would uh, kind of sort of th and that's kind of then makes you even more isolated you know in a way you can kind of feel like you you're isolated because you're different to everybody else and then I was kind of further isolating myself by uh, not asking for help because I didn't want to, to look weak or flawed um, and uh, and then I realized that I was actually making life really difficult for any woman coming after me as well um, because I was just setting ridiculous standards for myself and for everyone else um, and uh, and I'm a human being and I we're all deeply flawed um, and uh, and I think I kind of it, you know I sort of definitely try to portray myself in this I've got to behave a certain way because I've got to be taken seriously I don't know if you can see in this light, but I've got pink hair now, but I definitely would not have had pink hair in my early career. Uh, and um, I kind of felt like I had to, you know, look a certain way and act a certain way and 
be super serious uh, in order to be taken seriously. I mean, maybe it's a privilege of seniority that I don't think that I need to do that anymore or because I've got this, like a personal brand that precedes me. And, you know, I'm kind of famous for having a terrible sense of direction. Even though I did orienteering competitions, I can read a map and use a compass, but I come out of tube station, I've got no idea where I am. And uh, kind of yes, yeah, need an audience survey map and a compass at kind of at all times. So those types of things, I'd be like felt that I had to really hide the, all of that stuff about myself. That I'm, you know, a little bit silly sometimes, and I'm clumsy because otherwise I wouldn't be taken seriously at work. And I kind of think that that's. Uh, I feel a bit sad telling you about that almost because I'm kind of hiding a lot of of, of who I was, um, and I defeminized myself as well. Um, in many ways, because I felt like I had to, you know, portray this image. I, uh, you know, kind of fell into a trap of wearing trouser suits, which are great, but it's, you know, it's not who I am. Black trouser suits and uh, and just uh, kind of then became very self-conscious about um, kind of wearing makeup or wearing skirts and stuff. And it, like I got over it, obviously got over it, but um, it's just uh, I just felt self-conscious. Uh, and again, it's that kind of sort of sort of burden that I'd put that I'd put on myself not because of anything specific that anyone had said kind of wish wish I hadn't done that I think I probably would have been freer and happier and maybe more creative uh, and it's not yeah I think it probably took its toll it was like I've, uh, I just feel like a therapy session <laughs> and I think it's I wasn't comfortable in my own skin and that in the environment I was in and it wasn't lacking confidence in my technical skills I don't want to sound you know I, I definitely did not lack confidence in my technical skills um, it's uh, it was being uncomfortable in, in my own in my own skin in that in, in that environment, um, and which then probably portrays itself as a lack of confidence, which is is it, you know, and, the, and those two things are, are really quite different. Um, and I actually gave a, a career talk to a government department <clears throat> about being an imperfect role model. It's actually an important aspect of being a role model to to admit to being imperfect and kind of go well, I'm I'm not sure about that or. Um, you know, just because I'm up here on a stage talking to hundreds of people, don't for one minute think that I didn't lie awake all night last night regretting my decision to agree to this. How do you ensure your tech team fosters a culture of inclusivity? So I think the, um, in terms of recruiting people, recruiting people through a variety of routes um, is, uh, is absolutely essential. So talk about un unconventional routes for, for recruiting people. Most companies know how to recruit people um, whilst they're at university or just after they've graduated, for example, that's, that's quite a well-oiled machine. Um, that doesn't get you the experienced hires uh, and those people may be experienced in your domain or outside of it. So they might already work in tech and they might not. So there's different ways of recruiting people and people those things. I think what's absolutely key is to having um, a diverse set of people involved in the recruitment process. Um, and uh, because if, if it's uh, partly because it um, presents the uh, a kind of more attractive face to the people that you're trying to recruit, um, if they meet a bunch of people who all look and sound the same, uh, then they'll just might assume that the entire company looks like that. Um, and uh, the uh, and also you get a, a sort of different lenses in terms of that decision making process, you're more likely to, to hire a, a more diverse set of people. It's absolutely key. Um, the, I think there's a, there's a lot being done to um, to recruit more diversely in kind of more entry level tech roles now. I think there needs to be more that happens um, at disrupting that in the more senior roles. So, so I'd argue that there aren't that many people in big companies who actually started as, as software engineers. I'd say I'm kind of almost as unusual for being a computer scientist at my level of seniority in a tech organisation as I am for being a woman. Um, so when somebody hides behind the pipeline and says, well, we, you know, we don't have many women or many, many ethnic minorities in senior roles because they're not entering the tech industry, I just think, well, that's, I don't buy that as an excuse. It's, uh, you, you know, if, if they're not looking at, looking at the skills needed for, di for different jobs, not everybody needs to be a, a coder. Um, so uh, I think the kind of more thought needs to be given to that. Um, uh, and then obviously having... It's all very well recruiting people, but you need to have an inclusive culture as an organisation that needs to be taken very seriously. It can't be an afterthought. It needs to be woven through all of your measures in terms of what leadership looks like, how people behave and respect towards each other, um, and uh, and how not just in terms of the pivotal points around um, promotion process and hiring, for example. 
um, because otherwise you'll attract a more diverse talent pool uh, and then struggle to retain them. And we know that um, historically the tech industry and engineering have um, had uh, a smaller proportion of women than men joining at graduate level. Um, and But the kind of exit rate from the industry is faster for women than for men, partly because of some, I think some of the things that I talked about with regards to kind of feeling like that you don't really fit um, and creating those kind of sort of sort of burdens on yourself and um, and oftentimes even the more technical women um, will get tasked with uh, less technical roles because of what I call benevolent sexism um, seen as being better at being organized more people skills communication skills and so on which can detract from actually developing the technical technical skills even though it's not seen as, as being a kind of uh, a, a sexist thing so, uh, so having that in inclusive culture is absolutely key to retaining that diverse talent. Um, but I'm kind of, I love the number of external initiatives there are now to get more women in, and girls into, into tech. Those just didn't exist, um, you know, when I when I was a kid. How can companies avoid tokenism of women and their tech teams? Yeah, so I think it's it's a really interesting question. I I don't think that. Um, that tokenism really happens in the workplace, but people think that it does. And what I mean by that is if there's, say, a leadership team and there's one woman on it, other people will will sometimes make the assumption that she was the diversity hire um, or is there by tokenism rather than being there entirely on merit. Um, and then we hear people talk about the business case for diversity um, and actually uh, those, um, the more that I've thought about it, the more those things actually grind my gears a little bit in that it's, um, we don't, you know, what is the case for homogeny? And why don't we talk, when somebody uh, hires, when you have a leadership team of people who look the same and may even have almost identical names uh, and uh, identical backgrounds um, and so on, they, uh, nobody kind of questions like, oh, well, that person was just hired because they're the same as everyone else. And I think we need more of that. It's like, oh, you've got another homogeny hire. Maybe homogeny is not the correct grammar, but you have, you've got another homogeny hire there. Uh, so let's, I don't know, make up a name. Let's call him Andy. Oh, Andy, he's a homogeny hire. And kind of shift the conversation away from like the diversity hire or the tokenism for, uh, for somebody who's different to the majority and instead kind of point out that, oh, yeah, we've got another... Um, and I'm not picking on Andy's or Jim's. We've got another Andy or another Jim that uh, he must be a homogeny hire. Um, and I think just shift that shift. If we all start doing that, it'll shift that mindset because people notice difference. They don't notice similarity. Um, and so, uh, you know, people won't people. I've noticed that, that people will um, walk into a room, for example, virtual or physical, and they won't clock that almost every single person in the room almost looks exactly like them, sounds just like them, has the same accent, is the same age, has the same haircut. Uh, and it's just like, it, it's just normal. Um, and then if there's one person who's different, then they kind of, then they notice, then they notice th that difference. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, I don't know if I'm explaining that very well, but I think we should you know, kind of switch the sort of the, you know, I don't, I've never seen a woman actually be put in a team just because she's a woman. I think she's often will have had to have worked harder and be more talented uh, than her male peers in order to be in that position. Um, so I think it's something to actually celebrate. But you still get the people kind of whispering around the edges like, oh, she's only there through tokenism. They will actually, uh, uh, are the men not there through tokenism in a way because they, they actually look the same as, uh, as the person in, uh, in the grade above them.